Hello, I'm Nels Jensen with the Business Press and welcome to our forum on healthcare in the Inland Empire and healthcare careers. Uh, joined today by four esteemed local experts, panelists if you will. Uh, immediately to my left is Dr. Richard Olds, Dean of the UCR Medical School and new to our region. Welcome. Uh, Patrick Petrie, who is CEO of the Arrowhead Regional Medical Center uh, in Colton, the public hospital for San Bernardino County. Uh, by Daniel Fontura, uh, Senior Vice President for the Loma Linda University Medical Center, and Phyllis Rowe, who is with the RCC uh, Nursing Program Professor of Nursing. Welcome uh, to all of you, and, and thank you very much. Um, talking about healthcare careers, we're going to start with more of a, a personal question, really. Um, how did you end up, uh, for each of you, how did you end up in a um, you know, healthcare specific career, and really, what does that mean to you uh, today? Uh, Dr. Olds, we'll start here and just go to your left. Well, I had an unusual preparation medical school. I was not pre-med. I was actually a psychology major. And I ended up as a tropical disease specialist, so I was drawn to the field mostly by an interest in service, particularly in national service. And it just worked out that uh, your career ends up with uh, a job like this at the end. But in terms of, of you know, being in a medical school, whatever, obviously that's, that's a really... Um, uh, real mission-driven career, so that must you know have great meaning to you in terms of service and. and well, that's why I took this particular job. Right. But I would say that in American healthcare in general, uh, that would be an unusual background, right. since uh, traditionally medical schools are much more hard science-driven uh, and uh, <coughs> not as let's say population-driven right. or, or driven, wellness-driven. Right. Right. So I think my background is unique for this particular medical school. Mm -hmm. All right, Patrick. Well, I, uh, I was drafted in the late 60s and ended up in the military. I'm from back east, and I ended up out here. And after I got out of the military, the economy was like it is now. Jobs were scarce, so I fell into health care. And over the years, uh, kind of worked my way up, got my education, um, and uh, spent a long time as a CEO in hospitals in, in L.A. County and moved to San Bernardino County about four years ago. But for me, healthcare is just is just a, a, a wonderful field, a wonderful career. And I know we're going to talk about healthcare reform later today, and the future of healthcare is very exciting and challenging and wide open for everybody. And I'm looking forward to it. All right, Daniel. Now, as I grew up actually in the Lomeland area, and so uh, I was actually suffused in the healthcare ambiance, if you will, and I certainly was drawn to it almost by default. Uh, enrolled UCR in 1985 as pre-med, but after a few science courses I realized that wasn't my uh, cup of tea. And uh, I opted instead for a business administration track and where I could actually work with people uh, and uh, with systems and numbers, and I've really enjoyed that. But the, the healthcare ministry for me has meant an, an industry, a calling of sorts that goes above and beyond just a job. You're actually uh, in a position to make a significant impact on people's lives every day, and I've enjoyed doing that. Right. And Phyllis? I grew up in a home with a physicist father, so I had a built-in tutor, and I always loved math. So I went to college as a math major, and in my second year, I went to a church presentation on missionary work, and there were all these nurses saving people in South America. So on the spot, I decided to be a nurse. And it has been a wonderful career for me. I graduated with a BSN from University of Illinois, and then we moved out here so my husband could go to UCR for his PhD, and then... I got a master's degree and a doctorate. When we moved out here in 1968, a bachelor's degree for a nurse was pretty big. And so I got hired right away by RCC. And to this day, I cannot believe how lucky I was to have such a wonderful career. Sometimes at the end of the day in the classroom, I look around the room and I think of the thousands of students that we have helped to achieve their most precious goal. Furthermore, we're contributing to health care in Riverside. I just, I'm so lucky. Thank you. The, uh, the region we live in has you know, obviously undergone this tremendous growth uh, population um, in, the, you know, in the 90s and in the most recent decade as well. Um, and we've heard along that time period too how it's necessary for us to diversify our economy and be less based on, on real estate, on manufacturing and transportation. Um, and it it's really would be uh, so good for our region to have more high paying jobs here in our base. And now, uh, as that catching up to that population base, we just see the most incredible expansion of healthcare 
facilities and services that we've ever seen in this market, whether it's the new hospitals opening uh, in Ontario, the replacement hospital in Fontana, expansions at almost a dozen other hospitals around here, um, you know, the new Loma Linda facility in Murrieta. Um, you know, how much of a driver, and, and I, haven't even, I haven't even mentioned the UCR Med School or the March Life Project at the, uh, at the former Air Base. How much can <coughs> healthcare be a driver of uh, our local economy? Well, I think that uh, one of the most important things to mention, besides the obvious construction and building aspects, is that uh, even today, 40% uh, of the healthcare dollars in the Inland Empire actually leave the Inland Empire and are spent somewhere else. So uh, it's not just that this is a growing industry from the standpoint of demand, because we'll talk later about the population expansion and aging, but right now we're losing almost half our healthcare dollars to other regions in California. So the more we can do together to keep people here close to home receiving their health care, uh, that is an immediate impact economically. In fact, every primary care doctor we can end up placing in the Inland Empire is a small business of about a million dollars. And, and I think, too, from, from an employment perspective, if you look at the economy impact on the Inland <coughs> Empire here in recent years, and you take Arrowhead, which is a public facility, uh, and we're one of those places that have grown, added 83 beds, new buildings, new services, and added almost 1,000 employees, up to almost 4,000 employees. It's still, a, it's a, still a tremendous place to get a job, to find a career and stay in the Inland Empire. So I, I still think, you know, healthcare, economically, when it's growing, it is a main driver. And I think we all know here in the last couple of quarters, it's one of the few segments of the economy that has continued to hire folks. You look around the country and you see examples uh, of how cities have transformed themselves, moving from um, more of an industrial uh, segment, for example, Pittsburgh, to more of a healthcare and education. Um, focus. <clears throat> and Pittsburgh's now really recognized as one of the hot spots for health care across the entire country. Sure, and, and biotech and other research, right. Absolutely. It all kind of feeds on itself. So I think that's a, a huge driver, potential driver of jobs uh, in the Illinois Empire uh, specifically. And I think that we've got the infrastructure, we've got the, uh, the, the, the population and the, uh, the educational infrastructure to do just that. Nursing in the Inland Empire faces at least two challenges. The first one is that our grads stay here when they, when they complete the program. And the second thing is that once they get a job, they stay in that job. So retention is a really big issue. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more uh, in segments later um, on sort of the, the situation around nursing and, and other services, because we face all sorts of dilemmas on that. Um, before we get to that, let's talk a little bit specifically about UCR and the medical school and the, the impact uh, that that has on the region because it, it really has multiple layers in terms of what that means for our area. Well, there's a huge physician shortage. That's probably the number one driver, particularly primary care shortage. You know, when we speak of the state of California, overall, the state of California does not have an overall shortage of physicians in general, although like all states, they have a shortage of primary care doctors. But some areas, for instance, the San Francisco area has twice as many specialists, almost two and a half times as many specialists as the California average, and has actually an excess of primary care physicians. Now contrast that with our area, where we have uh, about a third uh, you know, the primary care doctors we need in the more rural areas of our catchment area and no more than 40 percent even in the heart of our catchment area. And we actually, this is one of the few areas in the United States that actually has an absolute shortage of doctors of almost all specialties. So uh, that clearly is one of the major drivers of why we need more medical schools. But we would fail in that mission if all we did was build a medical school. Because doctors tend to stay where they train, not just where they go to medical school. Mm -hmm. So in designing the medical school, the design of the medical school, I think more accurately, would be described as a pipeline. On the front end, we need to take our medical students from the Inland Empire. If I had two students, one from Riverside, one from San Francisco, you realize there's virtually nothing I could do with the kid from San Francisco to get them to ultimately practice in the Inland Empire, where I have a fighting chance of a student from Riverside uh, ultimately practicing here. We need to design our medical school to turn out more primary care doctors. All the medical schools currently in California, only one in five of their graduates go into primary care. That's what we really need. Mm -hmm. We have to be more efficient than that. 
And finally, we need to build graduate medical education programs in areas of short supply, which includes all the primary care disciplines, also general surgery and a couple other areas where we have critical uh, supply shortages right here in the Inland Empire. That kind of structure has a fighting chance of ultimately delivering uh, on the, if you will, the manpower issue. So you're, you customize to the specific needs of the market. You're yeah, you know, just building another med school, quite frankly, wouldn't, wouldn't be the answer. We need a different kind of medical school and a different strategy if we want to address the manpower issue. I think the most exciting aspect of our school, though, is it, it shames me to say this is an unusual mission, but one of our missions is to actually improve the health of the people of the community we serve. I don't know why that isn't the mission of all medical schools, but it's not. And it's our mission, and so that will also mean that we work more closely with everyone in the community around the mutual goal of improving the health of our community, which, by the way, ranks in the bottom quartile of all the communities in California. Okay. Patrick? Uh, Doctor made great points. Just, just a few things to add from, a, again, a public hospital's perspective that's providing a ton of primary care to people who have no primary care physician. First of all, if you look at health care reform coming down the pike, and if you subscribe to a number between two and three hundred thousand of uninsured in our county, and theoretically that they will have an insurance product in four years, they're all going to be looking for primary care physicians. We absolutely have to have this medical school open. At Arrowhead, uh, one of the few hospitals in the country that has MD and DO training programs, we're looking to partner with it with the medical school and, and hopefully get those those uh, young physicians to do some training at uh, our hospital. But uh, the, but the issue of keeping these primary care physicians in the Inland Empire is the second piece of the puzzle, because if they go if they go out to the hinterland, it's not going to help. The largest provider of primary care right now in this county is the public hospital, and that's not good. Right. By the way, that's right. not good. Our emergency room at Arrowheads, the <coughs> second busiest emergency room in the state. And most of those visits are primary care. They shouldn't yeah. be in the emergency room. Right. So Dis we're looking forward to it. It's great. Despite how, uh, really, the healthcare system has expanded to have more touch points to consumers than, than before. Maybe not the, the most, you know, uh, the best touch points, but, it, but there are, uh, that's an interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Daniel, Loma Linda has uh, a medical school yeah. already. So how do you see uh, UCR's... Um, medical school, what does that mean for, for Loma Linda? Well, I think ultimately the statistics really can't be challenged. Uh, I think ultimately the situation that the Illinois Empire has with regards to under, under physicians, if you will, uh, is a real one that we have to address. And I think that what they're doing there will only help. What we also see as necessary is, using the metaphor of the pipeline, is after they exit or graduate from medical school, we need to find a place where they can train here locally. Uh, typically what you find is people after their residency period, whether three, five, seven years, uh, they tend to stay in those areas. What we want to do is have those training sites here locally as well. I think that will ultimately have a real tangible impact on the physicians per capita, where the Illinois Empire really is pretty low compared to our peers in the state and in the country. So working with local hospitals, uh, trying to find uh, opportunities for the training that the medical students emerging from UCR will have to practice as they grow and learn, I think is instrumental. Mm -hmm. As a nurse, I have to add that um, a ner adult nurse practitioners and other nurse practitioners are prepared to give primary care. And in fact, I looked up on the Board of Registered Nursing website, and uh, the definition of a nurse practitioner is a registered nurse who possesses additional preparation and skills in physical diagnosis psychosocial assessment, and management of health and illness needs in primary health care. And interestingly, when I was in my nurse practitioner program in 1984 even, uh, I worked with a nurse practitioner in Ontario who um, only had to refer out to the doctors in that group 0.5% of patients. I just always thought that mm -hmm. was an amazing statistic. So it sort of says that we do have another source of primary care um, throughout the United States and certainly within this area. And, and we'll talk more about that as well because I know one of the, the there, there are plenty of nursing programs, perhaps not enough in our region, there are a number of them. Uh, I know the shortage is actually people who can qualify to teach uh, those nursing programs. But as I mentioned, we'll, we'll hit that in the second segment as well. Now, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think it'd be worth saying because you brought up the issue. We need both Loma Linda and Western to succeed. Right. The shortage of physicians in the Inland Empire is so great 
In fact, there's a 3,000 physician shortage right now. No matter what any of us do, there will be a 5,000 physician shortage in 10 years. We need Loma Linda and Western both to succeed in this, and we need to succeed. And even with all three of us, and the nursing schools, and the PA schools succeeding, we will still have a shortage in 20 years, no matter what our best efforts make. Sure, and Western University in Pomona, which has greatly expanded uh, its facilities, huge campal campaign, um, uh, ongoing uh, and several new buildings on its campus. In that sense, it's really not a competition. It's a partnership that we all got to work together to solve that problem. So we also see, uh, I'm going to mention March Life Care, but we could be talking about um, whether it's Kaiser or Loneland, other expansions of facilities that include um, not just a hospital, but other services, um, you know, wellness and primary care associated with. But March Life is so ambitious, um, and, it, and it promises us to deliver a, a more complete package of, of health care. Um, what, what do you see for that potential? How could that change um, our region? Well, to be honest, I know about the facilities, but uh, it might be better to say, if I were designing a new medical center, what would be the ideas that I would incorporate into it? Because I'm not sure of all the details of what March Healthcare is doing. But I think if you look into the future, we're going to move away from a hospital-centric system. Uh, we're going to be delivering more health care in ambulatory settings, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, we're going to be delivering more health care at home. Uh, we're going to be, it's a more cost-effective way to do it. We're going to focus more on wellness and prevention, because mm -hmm. in the long run, the U.S. health care system is pretty poor value. We spent two and a half times the next closest developed country, and we're dead last, sure. 19 out of 19 developed countries in health care. So, Whatever facilities we build should be built around a different paradigm for delivering health care. And I hope that's what they build well, that's, it. That's what they're pitching. And interesting, the last forum we did on health care, Patrick Schmidt of uh, FFF Enterprises in Temecula, which delivers um, you know, vaccines and other supplies, called it a sick care system as opposed to a, a health care system. Um, so, but the Mar March Life is pitched as more of that holistic um, variety of services. And, and I think you even see it now in terms of even just some commercial real estate where, you know, medical is being welcome in a wide variety of types of developments because of some of the factors you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the um, wellness, fitness, um, care. It's, so, I, you know, I, to me, what March Life presents is, is, is just much more of a broad spectrum as opposed to just here, here's where you go when you're sick, here's where you go you know, overall for, for health and wellness. Um, and, and, and again, for us, uh, and we've talked to them very, very briefly about what, what they're up to. Now they, they will obviously serve a different population than we do, but I think you made a good point and they have a, they have a good vision, and that is when we're talking about primary care physicians or training programs or the Inland Empire, this thing about wellness and the population Again, a doctor made a great point about uh, where San Bernardino County, I'm not sure about Riverside, stands in its health statistics, which is very, very, uh, uh, very poor, uh, that we've got to get people in the Inland Empire, uh, the smoking, the drinking, the, the drug use, the obesity. Uh, I can't tell you the impact that that has on our public hospital in San Bernardino County. The, and, and the, the dollars we're spending to try to combat that. We have got to get people to pitch in and join folks like the four of us if we're going to have more physicians and we're going to have great schools and great hospitals like Loma Linda and great nurses. People have got to take better care of themselves mm -hmm. and help us. Mm -hmm. Now, Daniel, this is not new to Loma Linda. This is something you guys have been doing for years. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, part of the paradigm shift. It has to happen. I think in terms of self-efficacy, taking responsibility to some degree for one's own health, uh, creating the type of habits, routines that engender health. Um, obesity, a huge issue in this country. It will be an epidemic in a few years. As you see, childhood obesity, is obesity rates increasing. I think um, ultimately we're going to need more public health, more preventative health, mm -hmm. more health and wellness. And as I understand it, uh, at kind of a global level, you've got the centralized campus uh, at March, I think, uh, which intends to kind of do that to make this kind of a one-stop shop across the continuum for the health and wellness, uh, preventive medicine, all the way up through the tertiary coordinary care. So. Uh, you know, at this point, you know, more is better. Uh, I can't speak into the details of the program. Oh, sure. But, but I think the idea also is, is, if nothing else, is just clustering. So mm -hmm. you bring together, um, you know, the, the like-minded 
segments of an industry, and it really, you know, helps, you know, bring attention to it and drives more traffic, mm -hmm. whether it be, you know, consumers. Um, as far as uh, the March Life Center and RCC, we certainly hope to form a partnership um, with, between the Life Care Center and the School of Nursing, and then we have many other health care programs as well on the Moreno Valley College campus. And as far as the element that I think is the most um, attractive about the March Life Center is that all services, health care services that a person would need apparently will be offered there. And so the person is more likely to access those, whereas you go to your primary physician at a clinic and they say, well, you have to go over here to get your mammography. You have to go over here to get your lab work. And when it's all concentrated, there is some evidence that people follow up better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're going we're gonna, to uh, talk in our second segment, we're going to deal with how we meet demands. Uh, you know, in our market. But first, I'd like to conclude um, the first segment by talking um, about the health care reform. What, from your executive lens, what concerns you most about uh, the health care reform that we're undergoing in this country? Well, I think there are many things in health care reform that are beginning to move us in the right direction. But, you know, this is like turning an aircraft carrier. You know, this is, this is not, uh, you know, this immediate change is not going to change a lot in our health care system. It's starting to make movements in the right direction, but we're going to have to make a lot of changes in the health care system, and this is only one step. And so I think in, in one sense it's a good thing to get starting to work on this. Uh, there is a shift, for instance, for more uh, payment to primary care doctors. Mm -hmm. There is more of a focus around wellness, around not just paying for health care, but actually holding us uh, accountable for actually improving health care. I think those are all good things, but this is only really one step in what is going to be a very long process to turn around American health care. Okay. I, th I think we're looking at, at, at a 20 year process, and everybody's looking at 2014. I know we're preparing for 2014, understanding these health care exchanges and the populations that are going to be brought into health care for maybe for the first time. I think one of the huge issues is going to be is the administration of it, which I don't know that uh, anyone has a handle on. And what are the costs involved in administering this? Again, if you look at, at San Bernardino County and, and if you think that a significant portion of these folks are going to have insurance and choice in a product, how is that going to be uh, administered? Um, what's the cost going to be? I think there are huge questions out there, although it, it is a, a step in the right direction. But it's, it's a 20-year change, at least. I agree. I think that right now there are so many vested stakeholders with the system the way it is. There's a lot of inertia built up, and change can be incredibly difficult because, again, it consumes over 17% of our GDP right now. So a lot of folks like it just the way it is. Thank you very much. But the reality is, in 1960, it consumed about 5, 5.1% of our GDP. Some people don't realize the status quo is untenable. It's not an option. And there will be the slow, gradual erosion if we did nothing to a point where we would ultimately come to a cliff and it would be disastrous. So I think what we're doing is definitely addressing the issue at hand. It's going to be challenging, as we witnessed over the last year, 16 months in D.C. And, and more recently in Sacramento, but uh, change is inevitable. So is just the dynamic of change itself the most challenging part of this? No, I think ultimately you've got um, folks, again, who are profiting, I hate to use that word in healthcare, but uh, benefit from the way it exists now. Um, whether your vendors, providers, health plans, big pharma, medical companies, medical supply companies, uh, as long as you're part of that um, value-driven solution, as long as you're part of that um, uh, customer experience, as long as you're part of the industry now, uh, there are a lot of folks, again, who don't mind things the way they are. Right. But I think reform is going to have to happen. It'll have to happen, like Patrick said, incrementally, because I think revolution uh, is just not the way it's going to happen in, in this country. It's going to be an evolving, gradual series of changes. You know, ultimately, I remember hearing a um, uh, former majority um, leader, Tom Daschle, a few months ago in D.C. at a CHA meeting, and he said, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this amounted to glorified uh, insurance reform. Not even finance right. reform, right. not even healthcare delivery reform. reform. Right. It's the first step in a series of steps that have to happen to get us where we have to be.
Well, and, and that just as a, a consumer, that's what drives a lot of my family's health care decisions as well. Right. And Nels, if I can make one more point about you saying what the biggest challenge of health care reform, and I'll be the first to admit this on the panel, not everybody understands it yet. Oh, of course not. Okay, we right. are still wading through it and trying to position ourselves, but we're having difficulty understanding exactly what it, what it is. Sure, there, there are a lot of businesses that are facing a deadline uh, six weeks from now, five weeks from now, right. um, mm -hmm. that don't completely understand and can't adequately communicate right. to their uh, employees really what the impact is. So, oh, yeah, I, I think there's very much that case. Yes, I'm sorry, Phyllis. It's narrowing the field down, the focus down to nursing again. Um, I, obviously, one of the challenges is that we're going to need um, probably hundreds of thousands more nurses across the United States to handle the increase in delivery of health care. A good thing for us is with the focus on preventive care, we can make, shine in an area that uh, traditionally has been uh, one of the primary nurses' roles, and that is teaching. And hopefully we'll learn better techniques to, to help people change their lifestyle for the better. And um, I think that's, um, that's probably the, the comment I have about that, the uh, health care. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are going to take a, uh, a short break here. Um, and we'll be back to talk more about how do we get more primary care physicians, how do we educate nurses, and also what other careers really uh, are going to change the face of the healthcare care uh, industry. Um, you've been watching the uh, Healthcare and Healthcare Careers Forum on the Business Press. I'm Nels Jensen. We'll be back in a minute.
Hi, I'm Nels Jensen with the Business Press. You are watching the Healthcare and Healthcare Careers Forum. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Richard Olds, Dean of the UCR Med School, Patrick Petrie, who is uh, CEO of the Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, uh, Daniel Fontura from the uh, Loma Linda University Medical Center, and Phyllis Rowe from the uh, RCC uh, Nursing Program. Uh, Professor Rowe, we're going to start with you now. Um, we're talking about really meeting the demands of the constituents here. Um, you know, many more people coming into our region predicted for the future, an aging population. And I know one of the big issues, you know, typically people talk about a, a nursing shortage and other specialty shortage, but also there's a shortage of people who are uh, accredited to train uh, nurses as well. So tell us about the, the challenges and opportunities there. At Riverside City College, in terms of nursing faculty, we are very blessed. Um, we don't get a lot of applications for our positions, but we always have good applica applicants. So I think because of our reputation of excellence, we get um, we get we have a very highly qualified faculty. We have more doctorally prepared nursing faculty than uh, than um, many of the UCs do. So we're very proud of that. As far as addressing the nursing shortage, for approximately the last five years, we have had federal and state grants to increase our enrollment. In the RN program, we've probably doubled our enrollment, which means we've approximately doubled our graduates. And again, we hope that they stay in this area and practice. And in the vocational nursing program, we've increased um, about a third of, um, so we are putting out more graduates. We are. Um, attempting to meet the nursing shortage. Sure. We, we will uh, develop new programs as well. Now, but as a, as a region, we're going to be challenged to keep pace in terms of uh, turning out the number of qualified teachers, professors, uh, and also just the number of, of specialists, whether they be nurses or whether they be uh, clinicians or technicians uh, as well, right? Yes, that's true. Um, there is uh, legislation to consider the community college uh, um, awarding the baccalaureate, which is at RCC is the minimum degree for clinical nurse instructor. And uh, we do have um, institutions in our area that award higher degrees in nursing, such as California Baptist University and Loma Linda. We have California State University, San Bernardino. And um, so we see, and we have many flexible programs such as the University of Phoenix and the uh, statewide nursing program. Um, so we seem to, or in this area, we're lucky we do have an adequate supply of nursing faculty. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about, um, Patrick, I know you, know, you have a, a demand for many different positions at, at a hospital with a wide variety of services there. What, what do you see as some of the challenges in terms of, of you know, meeting those demands. Well, uh, my my personal observation is is I'm looking at uh, I, I have children in their early 20s. I'm looking at that generation still not gravitating to healthcare, for whatever reason. And uh, we talk about the nursing shortage, and I appreciate the fact you're bringing up at Arrowhead. We have shortages in, in all other key disciplines as well: uh, pharmacists, uh, radiology techs, respiratory therapists, people who can work in medical records. Uh, which has dramatically changed now in its emphasis and impact on an organization, uh, registration folks. Um, uh, the, the science and technology of healthcare uh, uh, is, is increasing in the complexity, so the, the, the non-nursing workforce requirements, I think, are significantly, the bar is higher than it was 5, 10, 15 years ago, and we're having difficulty filling those areas, and I appreciate the fact that there's been tremendous emphasis on nursing as there should be, married to a nurse, and there should be. However, um, I think some of the other disciplines have, have wavered. And again, I don't see, uh, I don't know if it's Gen X or Gen Y or Gen C, I've lost track, but I don't see the younger kids gravitating to, to healthcare careers, non-nursing, non-physician. Yet at the same time, whether it's the uh, you know public institutions or uh, especially some of the for-profit colleges are are offering specialty programs that allow you to get into a, a, a well-paying career in some of these in a relatively short order, 15 months, mm -hmm. 18 months specialty uh, certification so that you can be that radiologist or do something in phlebotomy or, or right. some of these, these other fields. So the, the opportunities are, are there, right? So how do, Daniel, how, do, how, do you, how does that um, shift 
how can that take place so that there are more people interested in these careers? Because they are some good paying jobs. No, uh, more than some. Uh, I've got an 11 year old, a 6 year old, and a 3 year old, and I'm going to uh, encourage them to consider health care seriously. Especially, again, not just because the, the demand for the foreseeable future is going to be high, but also because the wide range of jobs within health care. I mean, you've got something that can, that can appeal to most everybody. I mean, again, you've got coders, you've got um, clinical lab scientists, you've got uh, CT techs, ultrasound techs, you've got respiratory care practitioners, nurses, pharmacists. You know, there's a wide spectrum. Now you've got CRNAs, nurse practitioners, uh, PAs, um, phlebotomists. I mean, phlebotomy is a great entry-level career, a pharmacy tech, where after a year you can make, you know, uh, 16 $18 an hour. Uh, and then you can work your way up. Uh, different careers, continue your education along the way. And ultimately, I think some of the shortage is of our own doing. I don't think we've been as effective in marketing and educating the community, uh, even as early as a secondary school level, where folks in the high school years can say, hey, did you ever think about a hospital? Or all that, that actually is encompassed by a hospital and the variety of jobs that you can actually encounter therein and what it means to be you know, working in the lab working in the pharmacy, uh, working um, as a nurse, working you know, in any different, one of the different areas. So I think that ultimately uh, we can do a better job in terms of selling the product and selling these jobs to future generations. Sure, and would now some of these specialty services as well help keep that 40% you know, of customers going out of our market for health care here? I, I know there's lots of specialty services that Loma Linda offers, even that you know, Arrowhead and other large hospitals offer as well. But all right, so how does UCR fit into this dynamic? So, you, you know, we have, we have demand for many different careers in, in healthcare. Well, let me take a little different tact on the physician angle because, interestingly, California has the fewest medical school slots per capita of any state with a medical school. 17 med school slots per 100,000. The average is 30. So we have an interesting situation. There are five qualified California citizens looking uh, for medical school slots for every medical slot we can provide. I know this, I came from Wisconsin, 25% of my class came from the state of California. Probably a third of the kids training in Caribbean schools are coming from California. So I will argue in the medical profession, I'm not sure we're taking the right one. And here it's not just a matter of training more doctors, I think we should be looking at training different people to be doctors. Now if uh, most of us are also patients, when we think of the qualities that we want in our physician, Somehow, a really high MedCat and organic chemistry grade may not be the best selection criteria. So I would argue as we look at our medical school, I've already uh, alluded to the fact that if we want more primary care doctors uh, and we want them to stay in the Inland Empire, that we should have several selection criteria in the front end that relate to that. And it's probably not the highest grades. And it's probably not just random uh, uh, residency. So I'll also point out that uh, for 40 years, the med school I graduated from, Case West Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio, the only predictor of a career in primary care on the admission application was previous service in the Peace Corps. And so I'm going to suggest that selection of students based on a commitment to service, uh, a selection on other personal qualities uh, uh, is, is just as important as how high their organic chemistry grades are and their MedCAT sure. scores. And because we have such a physician med school shortage, the tendency is just to pay, take the kids off the top and, and we shouldn't be surprised that a lot of them aren't that interested in going into people oriented specialties in medicine and that they're driven by other motivations. I would argue that one of the keys to the success of our med school will be not only some of the geographic and, and uh, educational differences that we create but picking students that have a different motivation to go into medicine and I think we'll be happier with the outcome. And so in addition to having a different med school, we should be drawing people back into the medical profession that are not necessarily science majors. Uh, have post-baccalaureate programs that take bright kids that are in anthropology or sociology mm -hmm. who have real skills but just don't happen to have the science background to go to med school. We got to get those people back into medicine, back into nursing, back into pharmacy. I think that they have other skills that are going to be important for the healthcare profession besides just being good scientists. So let me try to, you know, make sure I, I capture that from a slightly different perspective. So as the, the variety and skill sets of physician positions and what they do has evolved, 
the selection process really hasn't um, evolved Changed. with no. it. No. And right. it's just, it's easy. Obviously, it's easy to just look at who got the highest grade. And it involves a more complicated process to pick the right students. But in a market where, you know, you got five, I'm not talking about unqualified, you have five qualified candidates for every single slot that we have, maybe we should <coughs> give more thought to who we actually want as physicians. And this is also changing just in the demographics of uh, uh, last year, was the first year, that more women are going to med school than men, much to the advantage of our profession, by the way. <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, half my catchment area is Hispanic, and only 5% of our physicians are. If we're ever going to change obesity and behavioral changes and get people to stop smoking, we have to have more healthcare professionals that come from that community. It's not enough to just speak Spanish. We have to have more uh, medical doctors that were born and raised in those communities if we ever want to have an impact on improving the health of our community. Sure. And, and I can't help but think, listening to Dr. Olds and Daniel speak, that uh, have, we, uh, have we missed the boat and we need to, to, to not miss it in the future in, in letting, letting these folks know there's more careers in hospitals than just nurses and physicians. Right. You know, because when you, when you look and you watch TV or you hear anything, I, I think these kids don't know all the, the jobs that Daniel was mentioning. And you look at the Inland Empire and all the unemployment and look at the great opportunity. I mean, there's great hospitals. There's probably 10,000 employees between Daniel and I and a great opportunity. And, I, and no one knows about it. So how do, how do we do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know sitting here, but we need to figure it out. Sure, okay. We and need to figure it out. Now, now, Daniel, you know, Loma Linda is em employing researchers, employing, you know, uh, uh, surgeons, employing uh, general care physicians. I mean, you, you, you employ the whole spectrum of um, medical professions, really. So, you know, what's your lens on, uh, on Dr. Old's comments? Uh, I, I totally support them. Uh, I think ultimately we're going to have to go local, find out what actually our market is, what are the demographics of our market, and how do we best serve that uh, demographic. And I think the reality is uh, there is a mismatch between what we've got, what we're recruiting, and who we serve. We're going to have to try to close that gap. You know, there are a lot of high schools that we probably could be more active and proactive in visiting, educating, marketing to. I know that we don't do a good job in that area. Um, but maybe as a, a coalition, there's uh, more resources, more focus, more time and energy spent on exposing these kids at an early age when they're starting to think about, oh, do I end it here? Do I go vocational school? Do I go to RCC? Do I go to local college? Uh, do I go to four-year uh, university? You know, starting to think about, hey, you know, healthcare is an emerging field. It's a big part of our economy. There is, for better or for worse, a lot of stability uh, in, in, the, in this industry, and there are a wide range of jobs. And let's maybe expose them to five, ten, maybe fifteen of the basic elementary um, core fundamental type jobs. And I think there's probably a good chance that we'll get some traction in the minds of the kids at that age. Mm -hmm. I think one thing we all can share is uh, whether it's the nursing professions, all the allied health professions, mm -hmm. or the medical school, we need to strengthen that pipeline. And that pipeline, quite frankly, has to start down in the K through 12. Mm -hmm. We've got to get more kids interested in healthcare related uh, careers, science, mm -hmm. uh, other <coughs> technology driven industries, the way, quite frankly, China and India yeah. is. Uh, <laughs> and we have to have high schools that are maintaining that interest. So, uh, those of us in the sort of the professional schools at the end, we have to be committed to developing that pipeline in our own communities. And if we don't help do it, it's not going to get them. Yeah. And, I, and I hear the comments um, by Dr. Olds, and I, and I actually am thinking about the, the dynamic of, of, a, of a nurse versus a nurse press practitioner versus a, a physician. You know, in, in some ways, um, you know, young girls have um, shied away from um, hard sciences and math uh, as they get through high school. I can see it in my own household happening as well. Yet um, the service-oriented is, is exactly what you're talking about. So I imagine that you're seeing some of this, you know, in nursing schools as well, right? You ha you have uh, women who could be uh, physicians, you know, as well as nurses. The choices that they're making for whatever reason. An interesting trend that we've seen at RCC, although our average age uh, has not changed in years, uh, it's about 32. Um, so we're getting the older student, and we find that many have either earned uh, bachelor's degrees mm -hmm. or master's degrees, and uh, we have many second careers. 
Um, I count the number up on stage often when I'm sitting there at our graduation pinning ceremony, and it's about 25% men now, and they think that this is a, a marvelous career. We get very good uh, feedback from them. So there is hope that um, the younger generation will eventually <coughs> gravitate to health care. What I see in my daughter's friends who went to a liberal art college, arts college is they can, they, some of them have gone into nursing and some of them have gone into other health care fields. And I think that's an advantage because um, they have that broad liberal arts education and perhaps more acceptance of differences and understanding across cultures and now they're going to apply it specifically to a healthcare career so we're getting better educated practitioners sure and just a wider variety of skills in these healthcare facilities you know as, as you pointed out daniel it, you know you can be an accountant to you know a surgeon absolutely but, so how do we how do we encourage more people to be primary care physicians is it something about the the, the lifestyle about the economics what what is what are the drivers changing that dynamic we took a major step and dr old already mentioned it we're going to pay them more yeah. <laughs> we have got to pay them more dr olds knows more about this than i do but obviously primary care physicians on the physician spectrum are at the lower end as far yeah. as pay we've got to pay them more yeah. One A, step one A in my opinion. We struggle too uh, in attracting, retaining uh, good primary care physicians, whether they're family medicine, internal medicine, general medicine, pediatricians. Uh, unless you have the proper payer mix, which in the Illinois Empire isn't always easy to generate, uh, you're going to have a struggle. And it's almost embarrassing for me to look at region wide salary figures for primary care physicians. It's really tragic. It, it was, I mentioned commercial real estate earlier. I went to a, um, a discussion where they were just talking specifically about medical in the commercial real estate world. And uh, uh, somebody pointed out that, you know, you can always count on if, if you have a doctor office in your, you know, in your property, uh, even if they have a horrible credit rating, uh, they pay their bills. And it was like, it, it, there's a profile. It's like, okay, they're old enough to have their own business. They're established. They have lousy <coughs> credit. They pay their bills. They're divorced. But, you know, I mean, it, but it was am amazingly how everybody in the room was nodding their heads because they could relate to that on, on, on some level. So, you know, how, but how do, how do we um, help that lifestyle as well. I mean, that, that goes all the way to some of the stereotypes about why do I want to be a doctor if I'm going to work 90 hours a week? Well, I think that, you know, we've created a quite a crisis situation, and it's going to take more than just one part of the solution. Uh, let's just look from a comparative standpoint. Nationally, we underpay our primary care docs, but in the state of California specifically, doctors in general are paid about the national average, but our cost of living is higher. So we already have a problem. But we're paying our primary care at 90% the national average. So we are proportionally underpaying our primary care in California, even compared to the rest of the United States. We clearly are going to have to fix that. I think the second issue I already commented on, we've got to bring some different people into the right. medical profession that are more interested yeah. in people yes. and in service. <coughs> and, and, exactly. and I think that's an important mm -hmm. issue. But we also have to present in our education of doctors a more favorable and more appropriate view of primary care. All of our medical education, almost in both medical schools and in, in uh, residency training programs, is very hospital-centric, is very fragmented. You meet a patient, you may only know them for three days, you never see them again. The great joy of taking care of patients, quite frankly, is developing a relationship with patients where you see them over time and you work with them. Our students don't see this, our residents don't see this, so we need fundamental changes in the way we educate our students to present primary care careers in the way that is yeah. an appropriate uh, presentation of what is a very rewarding career. Yeah. And that requires reform in medical stu student education and in graduate medical education, which is also very hospital-centric. We've got to be more clinic-based, ambulatory-based, longitudinal learning-based. That's why you got to start a new medical school if you really want to change that paradigm, because getting existing medical schools to turn that around is really hard. Along those same lines, you want to make sure that the profile, in essence, of your candidates coming into school, whether nursing or medical school, is appropriate. I mean, 
we can attest to the fact that hospital care, health care is not easy. These jobs are difficult, people in pain, uh, suffering, they're upset, they're angry, they're confused, a lot of medical jargon being thrown around, they don't know what's going on. Uh, this really has to be almost a calling, and I'm sure Phyllis can attest to the fact that the, 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 the caliber or the motivations have changed from your students now versus what they were 20 years ago. Yes. Um, one of the downsides of there being so much money in healthcare is that you're attracting people who aren't motivated to serve, who are motivated by other interests. And I think ultimately our challenge is to pick the right people, not just based on their test scores, but based on a variety of other factors that play into who they are and how they're ultimately going to serve the patient, how the tone is set between the patient and themselves and the whole care provider team that they have to work with and making sure that safe patient-centered care is provided. Mm -hmm. we, we have a golden opportunity to address that to a certain extent because yes we do see more of an emphasis on I want this job because it's a good income, solid income and I know that I'll have a job and um, that's, let's face it, that's a realistic motivation but we should use our opportunity and that is as faculty we need to model the service part of this and the ethical part of it and talk every day about values and mm -hmm. our patients and treating them with respect mm -hmm. and um, the minimum that we have them is a year and I do believe that we can make some inroads Absolutely. in their attitudes in a year if every single day we go in with a passion to um, talk about nursing and why we're there, health care yeah. and what, we're, what our goal is. And Patrick, I, I, you know, there's all sorts of thoughts running through my head on what that would be like at, at Arrowhead because you, you can't work in that environment if you don't have some sense of, of the mission. And, and right, and, and I think when we're talking about health care reform and, and, and what Dr. Rolls was saying about a primary care physician, just think of, our, of our, our population, our marketplace, they're crying for that relationship with the physician that they've lost over the last 10 or 15 years with managed care, what have you. They want that relationship back. They, everybody wants their primary care physician. And, and we have a saying at Arrowhead that if you don't have it here, you're in the wrong profession. And I think uh, while certainly health care uh, pays well for, for whatever job you have, we've all said, Daniel just said it too, that you've got to have a little bit of, uh, of some compassion and, and dignity for your fellow human being to, 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 to be successful. Yeah, at the same time when you're dealing with you know, we, we talk about insurance reform, let alone liability, let alone regulatory. I mean, it's. it's I disagree it's with Daniel. I think healthcare is very easy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also <laughs> worth mentioning that healthcare has become a team sport. Absolutely. And as a result of that, we have to think about that in who comes into the profession and how we train them. Uh, it is so complex that no one individually can do this. And so training physicians with nurses, with pharmacists, with physician Good assistants, yeah. uh, actually having, if you will, team evaluations. So you're not just evaluated on your personal performance, but on the performance of your team mm -hmm. is a direction that we have to go in healthcare. And that's a, you know, doctors have historically thought of themselves, you know, as the, you know, the icons uh, of the profession and independent uh, making decisions. Really, you're part of a team and we need to both select our medical students and train them to be strong team members. And that's, I think, going to be a future of our educational process yeah. as well. I, I, I hear a new business model, um, you know, as opposed to here's my, you know, primary care physician, here's a cluster it of... It is the business model. That is how healthcare, even the when we talk about uh, the medical home model, which is you, you've heard, which is <coughs> one of the few places where we can decrease cost and increase quality, it is a team approach. You're no longer cared by a single person, but a group of people, hopefully that you get to know, that work together to take care of your health care needs. There's no single person that can do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And but we're, we're going to, I saw, I, what I hear you saying also is we're going to see more businesses um, coming up to serve wellness and Absolutely. medical services. In fact, in fact, you're going to see more. We talked about integration of healthcare services like the pharmacists, the therapists, et cetera. But I believe in the future that you're going to see things like fitness centers and, uh, and restaurants and uh, uh, health-related uh, uh, top-end uh, grocery stores and educational facilities uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, child learning centers and other things that we have not thought of as part of the healthcare profession are going to be integrated in what we do. 
as we look toward wellness, as we look toward keeping people healthy, if we, as we look toward lifestyle changes, those components of, uh, that have never been healthcare issues are going to become part of our facilities and part of our training. They should be. I think, I think at Arrowhead every Friday we call it Fit Friday and we encourage all of our employees to wear athletic shoes and to walk at least three miles as corny as that may sound. Mm -hmm. That's a step in that direction. Sure. Well, we, we've seen, um, you know, hospitals in uh, uh, Fontana, Kaiser and Fontana has a farmer's market. All right, let's right. buy more fresh produce, let's right. eat, eat more healthy. Um, we're going we're gonna to wrap up now, and I'd like to give each of you a, a you know, minute and a half or so. Um, you know, really, what, what, what do you, all right, a minute. We'll take a minute to <laughs> say 30 seconds, whatever. Uh, basically, you know, what, what do you see as a really key component in our evolution of, of healthcare careers? You know, from your lens, we each have slightly different lenses, but Phyllis, why don't you start? Um, what's, what's a key component from your perspective about the future of healthcare careers? Um, I can speak to nursing, uh, basically. What I would like to see for nursing is that we um, get rid of the hierarchy and uh, have a seamless transition um, and real career ladder. And I envision this for RCC as well. We are building a new, um, a new building, and we're going to have space for that. It's on the corner of, the, <coughs> uh, well, it's near the corner of Magnolia and uh, 14th Street, and it will open in probably January of 2012 and we're going to increase our space by four times. So we will, so my vision and my hope is that we would have a curriculum that starts at CNA, Certified Nursing Assistant, then goes to LVN as the first year, and during the CNA they would be taking their general ed and their sciences, and then they would go, the second year would be LVN, the third year would be ADN, and the fourth year would be BSN. And there is a model out there in which the um, students automatically are enrolled. So they don't even, it's not like they have to reapply for each step of the way. They're enrolled through, through the BSN program. Of course, they don't have to take that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And they may have to stop out for some reason. But I just think that would be so healthy for nursing and healthy for the um, healthcare careers industry because uh, we would be more of a team. Right. Okay, excellent. Daniel? I think the demands currently and the demands in the future uh, for healthcare are so great, it's going to require increased collaboration uh, with us as potential competitors, but also potential teammates to support the needs of the empire. I think we each have our own distinctive niche, and there to need to be more of us even uh, to do better jobs of providing safe patient-centered care. I think ultimately the ministry that uh, we have at Loma Linda is a significant one. I think it also uh, requires us to be selective about who enters the profession and what the values are. Uh, they come out, um, living out in their day-to-day -day profession. Uh, so I think the future is very bright. I think there are lots of different career options for people. It's just uh, a matter of getting the word out and creating enterprises where people want to come to and stay and give their best day in, day out. Okay. I'm going to steal Daniel's idea that he mentioned earlier. We have got to, from a career perspective, non-physician, non-nursing, start planting seeds or processes somewhere. And you had mentioned uh, elementary school, and I'm not sure where, what the answer is. To let people understand that you can be a coder and make $70,000. You can be a pharmacy tech and make $50,000. Uh, you can be a respiratory therapist. You can be this, you can be that. And, and to try to attract uh, a, a new group of people to fill these voids that we're going to have in the next uh, 20 years as we evolve into health care reform and more people have access. All right, Dr. Olds? Well, I think as was mentioned earlier, the fundamental health care delivery system in the United States is unsustainable. And uh, we're going to have to have some pretty radical changes in how health care is delivered. Uh, in what we value and what we pay for in the organization of, of the healthcare industry. That provides an unusual opportunity when you're starting something new like a medical school to not design the med school based on what historically med schools have done, but rather look at what a med school for our future healthcare system really needs 
And that's what's really exciting about coming to the University of California Riverside. Not only is the need great, but the opportunity to create a medical school around a different paradigm exists there. And if successful, it could then be used as a model to help change the existing medical schools in a positive direction. That's why I came here, and I think that's what's, for me, the most exciting opportunity here at this medical school. Very, uh, very interesting. Um, you've been watching the Healthcare and Healthcare Careers Forum. Uh, this information will be uh, available on demand on thebizpress.com. Uh, excerpts will be in the August 30th issue of the Business Press, and we'll undoubtedly have more excerpts uh, in weeks to follow after that. Uh, I'd like to thank Phyllis Rowe from the Riverside uh, Community College um, Nursing Program, uh, Daniel Fonterra from uh, University, the Loma Linda University Medical Center, I'm sorry, Patrick Petrie from uh, Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, and uh, Dr. Richard Olds from the UCR Medis Medical School. I'm Nels Jensen. Thank you for joining us.